Hello friends, welcome to Shankar Summary. We are going to discuss Environment Part 2. This is going to be the continuation of last week. Here, we are going to discuss 15 most important topics for prelims 2024. So, without wasting much time, let's get started. Our topic of discussion is about first international treaty to protect the high seas. See, UN adopted world's first international treaty to protect high seas. It was adopted by the International Conference on Marine Biodiversity of the Area Beyond National Jurisdictions. See, the High Seas Treaty aims to take stewardship of ocean on the behalf of present and future generation. It is adopted under the framework of UN clause and also know that it is legally binding in nature. It will enter into force after the ratification by 60 countries. Here it is important to know that the United Nations Convention on the Laws of Sea, that is UN clause, is an international agreement that establishes the legal framework for marine and maritime activities. It is also known as Law of Seas. It divides the marine area into five main zones, namely internal waters, territorial sea, contiguous area, exclusive economic zone and the high seas. Here it is important to know one more important term that is baseline. It is the low water line along the coast as officially recognized by the coastal state. Moving forward, let us see about the internal waters. See, internal waters are the waters on the landward side of the baseline from which the breadth of the territorial sea is measured. Each coastal state has full sovereignty over its internal water like its land territory. Now let's see about territorial sea. The territorial sea extends seaward up to 12 nautical miles from its baseline. The coastal states have sovereignty and jurisdiction over the territorial sea. These rights extend not only on the surface but also to the seabed, subsoil and even the airspace. But the coastal states rights are limited by the innocent passages through the territorial sea. Let's now see about the contiguous zone. The contiguous zone extends seaward up to 24 nautical miles from its baseline. It is an intermediary zone between the territorial sea and the high seas. And also know that the coastal state has the right to both prevent and punish infringement of fiscal, immigration, sanitary and custom law within its territory and territorial sea. Unlike the territorial sea, the contiguous zone only gives jurisdiction to a state on the ocean surface on the floor. It does not provide airspace rights. Let's now see about exclusive economic zone. See, each coastal state may claim an exclusive economic zone beyond and adjacent to its territorial sea that extends seaward up to 200 nautical miles from its baseline. Within its exclusive economic zone, a coastal state has sovereign rights for the purpose of exploring, exploiting, conserving and managing natural resources, whether living or non-living, on the seabird and subsoil. They have the right to carry out activities like the production of energy from the water currents and wind. Unlike the territorial sea and the contiguous zone, the exclusive economic zone only allows for the above mentioned resource right. It does not give a coastal state the right to prohibit or limit the freedom of navigation or overflight subject to very limited exceptions. Let's now see about high seas. See the ocean surface and the water column beyond the exclusive economic zone or referred as high seas. It is considered as a common heritage of all mankind and it is beyond any national jurisdiction. States can conduct activities in these areas as long as they are for peaceful purposes such as transit, marine science and undersea exploration. That's all about this discussion. With this basic understanding, let us try to answer this question displayed here. Consider the following statement with reference to UN clause. It is the only international convention which stipulates a framework for a state jurisdiction in maritime spaces. India is a party to this UN convention. Which of the statements given above are correct? One only, two only, both one and two, neither one nor two. And the correct answer is option C, both one and two. See, the UN clause is an international treaty which was adopted and signed in 1982. It replaced four Geneva Convention of April 1958, which respectively concerned the territorial sea and the contiguous area, the continental shelf and the high sea, fishing and the conservation of the living resources on the high seas. The convention has created three institutions on the international scene and they are the International Tribunal for the Law of Sea, the International Seabed Authority and the Commission on the Limits of Continental Shelf. See, UN clause is the only international convention which stipulates a framework for state jurisdiction in maritime spaces. It provides different legal status to different maritime zones. And also, it is to be noted that India is the party to this convention. So that's all for this topic. With this, let's move to our next discussion. 
Our next topic of discussion is about the various commissions and the authorities that were established to manage the water distribution in India. So let's discuss them one by one. The first one is Central Water Commission. The Central Water Commission is a key technical organization focused on the management of water resources in India. It operates under the Ministry of Jal Shakti, specifically within the Department of Water Resource, River Development and Ganga Regeneration. The main role of Central Water Commission that is CWC involves coordinating with the state government to develop strategies for controlling, conserving and utilizing water resources across the nation. This includes a wide range of activities such as flood control, irrigation, navigation, drinking water supply and water power development. Additionally, the CWC is responsible for investigating construction and execution of the related projects as needed. It is headed by a chairman with the status of ex officio secretary to the government of India. The next important body is the National Water Development Agency. See, the National Water Development Agency was established in 1982 as an autonomous society under the Society Registration Act 1860. It functions under the Department of Water Resource, River Development and Ganga Regeneration, which is a part of Ministry of Jal Shakti. The main goal of NWDA is to conduct detailed studies and investigations to assess the feasibility of linking river system both in peninsular and Himalayan regions as a part of National Perspective Plan for Water Resource Development. NWDA key activities include surveying potential reservoir sites and planning the interconnections of river. The second one is preparing detailed study reports of pre-feasibility reports, feasibility reports and detailed project reports on river linking projects. Third one is implementing, constructing or overseeing construction projects related to water resource management. The fourth one is transferring excess water from river basins to others, ensuring the needs of the originating basins are met. Overall, NWDA plays a crucial role in planning and managing India's water resources to prevent shortages and promote efficient use across states. The next is Central Groundwater Authority CGWA. See CGWA is tasked with regulating and managing country's groundwater resources. This authority has been constituted under Section 3 of Environment Protection Act 1986. Its main responsibility include ensuring that groundwater is being used sustainably and preventing its over exploitation and protecting it from pollution. The CGWA issues guidelines and permissions for drilling wells and extracting groundwater, especially in the areas where water levels are critically low. Know that Central Groundwater Authority has also framed revised guidelines for the grant of NOC for the groundwater abstraction industries and other projects in the country. In March 2024, the National Green Tribunal, that is NGT, expressed dissatisfaction over the Central Groundwater Authority Authority's response to the widespread issue of toxic arsenic and fluoride in the groundwater across India. With this, let's move to our next topic. Our next topic is COP, that is Conference of Party. This year, the 28th Conference of Party took place in Dubai, UAE, with the representatives from 197 countries presenting their initiatives to curb the global warming and engaging in discussions on the future climate actions. With this backdrop, let us understand what is COP. See, COP or the gatherings held within the framework of the United Nations Framework Convention on the Climate Change, that is UNFCC, a multilateral treaty established in 1992. These meetings are denoted by an acronym COP, serve as an official session of the Conference of the Party. During this session, participating countries evaluate the global endeavors aligned with the primary goal of Paris Agreement, aiming to restrict the global warming to approximately 1.5 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial levels. And also know that the COP are the main decision-making body of UNFCC. Now, have a look at this picture given here. It specifies the major outcomes of the COP meetings over the years. The last COP meeting, that is COP 27, held in 2022 in Egypt, the major outcomes have been displayed here, that is the loss and damage front has been established. USD 3.1 billion plan for early warning system has been stressed upon and new initiatives like African Carbon Market and Action for Water Adaptation and Resilience initiatives have been accepted widely. Now coming to the major outcomes of COP28. See this year, the COP28 countries agreed to launch the Loss and Damage Fund hoisted by World Bank for four years, aligning with UNFCC and Paris Agreement. All the developing countries are eligible and the contributions are made voluntary with a specific percentage earmarked for the least developed and developing countries. The next one is Global Stock Take. The COP28 released the fifth iteration of Global Stock Take, adopting eight steps to limit the global 
temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Here know that a global stock take is a process for the countries to see where they are collectively in making progress towards meeting the goal of Paris Agreement 2015. It was decided that the countries would assess their progress for the first time in 2023 and then every five years. It is to be noted that there is a need to cut 43% of greenhouse gas emission by 2030 compared to 2019 levels and the countries are off the track in meeting the climate goals. And the next most important outcome is a global cooling pledge. 66 national signatories committed to a 68% reduction in the cooling related emission by 2050. And the next one is climate finance. Here note that UNCTAD estimates the developed nations owe developing countries a 500 billion in 2025 under the new collective quantified goal for climate finance. And also know that the goal starting at 100 billion annually allocates 250 billion for mitigation, 100 billion for adaptation and 150 billion for loss and damage. Now moving forward, let us understand the shortcomings of COP28. It lacked clear timelines for the fossil fuel to phase out and there is an ambiguity in the tripling of renewable energy capacity, rising uncertainty and then the absence of specific measures criteria for the phase down of coal. Opposition from countries hindering the process on methane emission cuts including India. It is to be noted that India is not a part of global methane pledge. Now moving forward, Azerbaijan and Brazil will host COP29 in 2024 and COP30 2025 respectively. Now let us understand the initiatives that are being opposed by India for climate actions. The first one is coal phase out. Despite commitments to expand non-fossil fuel and renewable energy, India stands firm on non-pursuing on non-phasing out coal generated electricity in near term. And the second one is global methane pledge. Because of the worries about potential effects on the agriculture and the supply of electricity the nation has continuously opposed international initiatives of the Global Methane Pledge. The third one is Global Renewable and Energy Efficiency Pledge. India did not join the Global Renewable and Energy Efficiency Pledge at COP28. The fourth one is Loss and Damage Fund. Citing historical responsibility and objecting to the World Bank's temporary management of the fund, China and India both refused to contribute to Loss and Damage Fund. That's all about the discussion. With this basic understanding, let us try to answer a question. With reference to the agreement at the UNFCC meeting in Paris 2015, which one of the following statements are correct? The agreement was signed by all the member country of UN and it will go into effect in 2017. The agreement aims to limit the greenhouse gas emission so that the rise in the average global temperature by the end of this century does not exceed 2 degrees Celsius or even 1.5 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial levels. Developed countries acknowledged their historical responsibility in global warming and committed to donate 1000 billion US dollars a year from 2020 to help developing countries to cope with the climate change. Select the correct answer using the code given below. Option A 1 and 3 only, Option B 2 only, Option C 2 and 3 only and Option D 1, 2 and 3. And the correct answer is Option B 2 only. Because the statement 3 is wrong, developed countries acknowledge their historic responsibility in global warming and committed to donate a US dollars of 100 billion. And the correct answer is Option B 2 only. With this, let's move on to our next topic. Our next topic is ethanol blending. The national policy on biofuel notified by the government in 2018 envisaged an indicative target of 20% of ethanol blending in petrol by 2030. In 2014, only 1.5% 1 ethanol was blended in petrol in India. Given the encouraging performance and the various intervention made by the government since 2014, the 20% target was advanced to 2025 to 2026. The ethanol blended petrol program has been a significant accomplishment of the current government. The All India Average Blending of ethanol with petrol has risen from 1.6% in 2013 to 11.8% in 2022. Here note that ethanol is usually applied from sugarcane byproducts. See the sugarcane based ethanol production is preferred in tropical countries like Brazil and India. In case of sugarcane, the ethanol is produced by processing the molasses that is C heavy or the B heavy varieties. And also know that the sugarcane molasses is a dark, viscous and a sugar rich byproduct of sugar extraction from the sugarcane. Now moving forward, let us see about national biodiesel policy. The cabinet chaired by Prime Minister has approved national policy on biofuels on 2018. The policy categorizes biofuels as basic biofuel that is 
ஃபஸ்ட் ஜென்ரேஷனல் பயோ எத்தனால் அண்ட் பயோ டீசல் அட்வான்ஸ்ட் பயோ ஃபியூவல் செகண்ட் ஜென்ரேஷனல் எத்தனால் முனிசிபல் வேஸ்ட் டு ட்ராப் இன் ஃபியூவல்ஸ் தேர்ட் ஜென்ரேஷனல் பயோ ஃபியூவல் பயோ சிஎன்ஜி எக்ஸெட்ரா டு எனேபிள் எக்ஸ்டென்ஷன் ஆஃப் அப்ரோப்ரியேட் ஃபினான்ஷியல் அண்ட் ஃபிசிக்கல் இன்சென்டிவ்ஸ் அண்ட் ஈச் கேட்டகரி த பாலிசி எக்ஸ்பேன்ஸ் த ஸ்கோப் ஆஃப் ரா மெட்டீரியல் ஃபார் எத்தனால் ப்ரொடக்ஷன் பை அலோவிங் த யூஸ் ஆஃப் சுகர் கேன் ஜூஸ் சுகர் கண்டெய்னிங் மெட்டீரியல்ஸ் லைக் சுகர் பீட் சுகர் சோர்கம் ஸ்டார்ச் கண்டெய்னிங் மெட்டீரியல்ஸ் லைக் கார்ன் காசவா damaged food grains like wheat broken rice rotten potato unfit for human consumption for ethanol production farmers are at risk of not getting appropriate price for the produce during the surplus production phase taking this into account the policy allows the use of surplus food grains for the production of ethanol for blending with petrol with the approval of national biofuel coordination committee the policy encourages setting up supply chain mechanism for biodiesel production from non edible oil seeds used cooking oil short gestation crops now let us see major types of biofuel first one is bioethanol it is derived from corn and sugarcane using fermentation process a liter of ethanol contain approximately 2/3 of energy provided by a liter of petrol when mixed with petrol it improves combustion performance and lowers the emission of carbon monoxide and sulfur oxide the second one is biodiesel it is derived from vegetable oil like soya bean oil palm vegetable waste oil and animal fats by a biochemical process called trans esterification the third one is biogas it is produced by anaerobic decomposition of organic matter like sewage from animals and humans the fourth one is biobutanol it is produced in the same way as bioethanol through the fermentation of starch the energy content in the butanol is highest among other gasoline alternatives the last one is biohydrogen biohydrogen like biogas can be produced using number of processes such as pyrolysis gasification or biological fermentation it can be a perfect alternative for fossil fuel so that's all about this discussion so with this understanding let's try to answer the question given here according to india's national policy on biofuel which of the following can be used as a raw material for the production of biofuel cassava damaged wheat grains groundnut seeds horse gram rotten potatoes sugar beet select the correct answer using the code given below 1 2 5 and 6 1 3 4 and 6 only 2 3 4 and 5 only 1 2 3 4 5 and 6 the correct answer is option a 1 2 5 and 6 because groundnut seeds cannot be used under the national policy on biofuels with this let's move to our next topic our next topic is nilgiri biosphere reserve before getting into the discussion let's see a question with reference to wayanadu wildlife sanctuary consider the following statement it is a part of nilgiri biosphere reserve mountain temperate forest is mostly found in this sanctuary wayanadu wildlife sanctuary is bounded by mudumalai national park on the northeast which of the statement given above are correct so before answering this question let us understand the basics of nilgiri biosphere reserve so first of all what is a biosphere reserve see the concept of biosphere reserve was introduced and established under unesco's man and biosphere program during 1971 A biosphere reserve is a voluntary, cooperative and a conservation area. It is created to protect the biological and cultural diversity of a region while promoting sustainable economic development. Simply, it is a balancing between biodiversity with economic development. It provides an opportunity to scientists and managers to experiment and cooperate in generating data for understanding man's impact on nature. It is a place where local people, government officials and environmental group work collaboratively on conservation and developmental issues. See the two main biosphere reserves in Kerala are named as Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve and Agastya Malai Biosphere Reserve. The Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve was the first biosphere reserve in India established in the year 1986. It is located in Western Ghats and it includes two of the 10 biogeographical provinces of India. Wide range of ecosystem and species diversity are found in this region. The total area of Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve is about 5520 square kilometer area. The Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve encompasses part of Tamil Nadu, Kerala and Karnataka. The annual rainfall of the reserve ranges from 500 mm to 7000 mm with the temperature ranging from 0 degree Celsius during winter to 41 degree Celsius during summer. Now this point is very important. Note that the Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve falls under biogeographical region of Malabar rainforest. The Mudumalai Wildlife Sanctuary, Wayanadu Wildlife Sanctuary, Bandipur National Park, Nagarol National Park, Mukruthi National Park and Silent Valley are the protected areas present within this Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve. Now coming back to the question 
See the statement one is correct because Wayanadu Wildlife Sanctuary is a part of Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve. But the statement two and three are incorrect because moist deciduous forest and semi evergreen forest is mostly found here. Wayanadu Wildlife Sanctuary is bounded by Mudubalai National Park on the southeast. So the correct answer is option A, only one. With this, let's move on to our next topic. Our next topic is biodiversity heritage sites. Look at this question. Consider the following pair. Here, biodiversity heritage sites and the respective states are given. First one is Nallur Tamarind Grove in Andhra Pradesh, Baramura Waterfall, Odisha, Amarkantak, Madhya Pradesh, Aritapatti, Tamil Nadu. How many pairs given above are not correctly matched? Only one pair, only two pair, only three pair, and all the four pair. Before getting into this question, let us discuss about biodiversity heritage sites and how it is designated and their significance. See, biodiversity heritage sites are well defined, unique, ecologically fragile areas. It may be terrestrial, coastal, and inland waters and marine area. Biodiversity heritage sites are rich in biodiversity. Hence, they have a presence of rare and threatened species, ketone species, and the species of evolutionary significance. These sites have high endemism. Here, endemism means that a plant or animal lives only in a particular location. These sites have a significant cultural, ethical, or aesthetic values. It may be an important place for the maintenance of cultural diversity. Now, let us see who declare a site as a biodiversity heritage site. See, the State Biodiversity Board will investigate the suggestion for the declaration of the site. It may also also consider suggestions from the communities. All this happens through the Biodiversity Management Committees. It may also happen through other relevant community institutions including Gram Sabha, Panjayat, Urban Wards, Forest Protection Committee and Tribal Council. Then after the scrutiny, the State Biodiversity Board issues a preliminary notification to specify the boundaries of biodiversity heritage sites. After 30 days of the draft notification, there will be a public hearing. Then finally, the announcement of the establishment of the site will be done. Please note that India has around 37 biodiversity heritage sites in total and few important sites are given in this question. See, the Nallur Tamarind Grove is the first biodiversity heritage site of India and Gandhamardan Hill in Odisha is the last added site in the list. Okay, now let's solve the question that we have discussed. This question asks us to choose the incorrect pair from the list of biodiversity heritage sites and the states. See, the Nallur Tamarind Grove is in Karnataka, Baramura Waterfall is in Tripura, Amarkantak is in Madhya Pradesh and Aritapatti is in Tamil Nadu. Now take a note that Aritapatti is the first biodiversity heritage site of Tamil Nadu. See, the first and the second pair are not correct and since the question asks for the incorrect pair, the answer is option B, only two pair. With this, let's move on to our next topic. Our next topic is National Biodiversity Authority. Before getting into the discussion, look at this question. Consider the following statements regarding National Biodiversity Authority, that is NBA. NBA is a statutory body and its headquarters is located in New Delhi. NBA exercises the power and performs the functions of State Biodiversity Board for Union Territories. Which of the above statements are correct? One only, two only, both one and two, neither one nor two. Before answering this, let's understand the basics of NBA. First of all, know that NBA, that is National Biodiversity Authority, was established under the India's Biological Diversity Act 2002. It was established by the central government in the year 2003. So, NBA is a statutory body. Now, coming to its composition, it consists of one chairman and three ex-official members and seven ex-official members from different ministries and five non-official members. I have given a table of criteria for the appointment of the members of NBA. Just go through it. The most important thing about the composition is that all the members, including the chairperson, are appointed by the central government. Now, coming to the functions of NBA. See, NBA gives approval for certain persons for obtaining any biological resources occurring in India. See, they have to get the approval of NBA even for obtaining knowledge for research, commercial utilization, biosurvey and biotilization. Now we will see who these persons are. They include foreigners, citizens who are non-residents, organizations which are non-incorporated or not registered in India and the organization which are registered in India but has non-Indian participation in its share capital or management. See, these people cannot undertake any biodiversity related activities without the approval of NBA and also they cannot obtain the results of the research conducted by the other persons or organization without the previous permission of NBA. Secondly, NBA's approval is needed for applying for the intellectual property right for any invention based on any research or information about a biological resource obtained from India. Thirdly, NBA advises the central government on the matters relating to the conservation of biodiversity, sustainable use of its components and the equitable sharing of benefits arising out of the utilization of biological resources. Fourthly, 
NBA advises the state government in the selections of the areas of biodiversity importance to be notified as a heritage sites and finally NBA take measures on the behalf of central government which are necessary to oppose the grant of intellectual property right in any country outside India this is done when IPR is provided for any biological resources obtained from India or knowledge associated with such biological resources which are derived from India so from this we can say that NBA performs facilitative regulatory and advice functions for government of india on the issues of conservation sustainable use of biological resources and fair and equitable sharing of benefits arising out of these biological resources so that's all about this discussion now coming back to the question see the option 1 is incorrect because it is a statutory body and it was established under india's biological diversity act 2002 but the second part of the statement is wrong because its headquarters is located in chennai not new delhi the second statement given here is correct so the correct answer is option b only two. Our next topic of discussion is Indian Forest and Wood Certification Scheme. Recently, it is launched by the Ministry of Forest and Environment and Climate Change. It is also known as National Forest Certification Scheme of India. See, it is designed to promote sustainable forest management and sustainable management of trees outside the forest in the country. It offers voluntary third-party certification and also know that it provides market incentives to the various entities like state forest department, individual farmers or the former producer organization. that adhere to the responsible forest management and agroforestry practices in their operation they also know that it is applicable across the country both in forest area and trees outside forest plantation on the government private agroforestry and other lands here the certification applicable for both timber and non timber forest produce note that it includes three types of certification forest management certification trees outside forest management certification chain of custody certification see the forest management certification is based on indian forest management standards consisting of eight criteria which is an integral part of national working plan code of 2023 moving forward let's understand the institutional arrangement for indian forest and wood certification scheme see indian forest and the wood certification council act as a multi stakeholder advisory body indian institute of forest management bopal acts as the operating agency and responsible for the overall management of the scheme the national accreditation board for the certification bodies under the quality council of india accredited certification bodies to carry out independent audits of various entities so that's all about this discussion with this basic understanding let's try to answer this given question with reference to the indian forest and wood certification scheme consider the following statement it aims to promote sustainable forest management and agroforestry in india through voluntary third party certification Any forest with forest and wood certification is automatically considered a model of sustainable forestry. This scheme offers market incentives to various entities such as state forest department, individual farmers, FPOs and wood-based industry that practices responsible forest management and agroforestry. Which of the statements given above are correct? 1 and 2 only, 2 and 3 only, 1 and 3 only, 1 2 and 3. And the correct answer is option C. 1 and 3 only let's see their explanation see the statements 1 and 3 are correct whereas statement 2 is incorrect having the certification doesn't automatically make a forest a model of sustainable forestry while the certification is an important indicator of responsible management practice it is not the only criteria for determining sustainability other factors such as forest biodiversity the well-being of local community and the long-term health of the ecosystem should be taken into account that's all about this topic let's move on to our next topic of discussion with this let's move on to our next topic our next topic is about different types of protected area firstly what is a protected area see a protected area has been defined in the wildlife protection act of 1972 section 2 says protected area means a national park sanctuary conservation or community reserve these are notified under chapter 4 of wildlife protection act and also know that it does not include reserved forest moving forward let's see about wildlife sanctuary in brief it is a place that is reserved exclusively for wildlife use which includes animals reptiles insects birds etc wild animals especially those in danger of extinction are being kept here the wildlife protection act 1972 empowers the center and the state governments to declare any area a wildlife sanctuary national park or closed area nextly let's see about community forest resource according to section 2 of forest right act it is the customary common forest land within the traditional or customary boundaries of the village or seasonal use 
landscape in case of pastoral community including reserve forest and protected area such as sanctuaries and national park to which the community had traditional access nextly let's see about national parks it is notified by state government based on the reasons of its ecological faunal floral geomorphological or zoological association or importance needed for the purpose of protecting and propagating or developing wildlife therein or its environment no human activity is permitted inside the national park except for the ones permitted by the chief wildlife warden of the state under the conditions given in the chapter 4 of wildlife protection act and also know that there are 106 existing national park in india covering an area of 44402.95 square kilometer nextly let's see about reserve forest they are the most restricted forest and are constituted by the state governments on any forest land or wasteland which is the property of the government in reserve forest local people are prohibited unless specifically allowed by the forest officer in course of settlement see the reserve forest means the forest declared to be reserved by the state government under the section 20 of indian forest act 1927 or declared as a reserve forest under any other state act but what kind of land or forest can be reserved this is provided under the section 3 of the act according to it any forest land or a wasteland which is the property of the government can be declared as a reserve forest even the forest land or a wasteland from which government is entitled to forest produce can be declared as a reserve forest but note that after deciding to declare a reserve forest the state government has to appoint the forest settlement officer under section 4 this officer will enquire into and determine the existence nature and the extent of any rights alleged to exist in favor of any person in the land to be declared reserved another important forest category under the act is protected forest this one includes a forest land or a wasteland having the same condition as reserve forest but which is not included in the reserve forest area there are many differences especially in the act permitted in a reserve forest and a protected forest let's see one by one firstly the state government can make rules for clearing and breaking up a land for the cultivation or other purposes in protected forest this means this activity that is clearing or breaking up any forest land for cultivation or any other purpose are allowed in protected area but the same is generally prohibited in reserve forest secondly the state government can make rules for cutting the grass or permits cattle to trespass or generally prohibited in reserve forest and punishable under the act that's all about this discussion with this basic understanding let's try to answer this question consider the following statement reserve forest is declared by the state government whereas protected forest are declared by the central government pasturing of cattle is allowed in the protected forest whereas the same is completely prohibited in the reserve forest which of the above statements are correct one only two only both one and two neither one nor two the correct answer is option d let's look at the answer key see the statement 1 is incorrect because both are declared by the state government statement 2 is also incorrect because pasturing is allowed in reserve forest with the permission of forest settlement officer it is not completely prohibited with this let's move to our next topic our next topic is biomass productivity in ecology the term productivity refers to the rate of generation of biomass in an ecosystem usually expressed in units of mass per volume per unit time such as grams per square meter per day the unit of mass can relate to dry matter or the mass of generated carbon the productivity of autotrophs such as plants is called primary productivity while the productivity of heterotrophs such as animal is called secondary productivity the productivity of an ecosystem is influenced by a wide range of factors including nutrient availability temperature and water availability understanding the ecological productivity is vital because it provides insights into how ecosystem functions and the extent to which they can support life look at the table here it gives the producer and the biomass productivity levels see the swamps and marshes have a biomass productivity of 2500 coral reefs at 2000 algal bed at 2000 river estuaries at 1800 and temperate forest at 1250 whereas cultivated land are at only 650 tundras are at 140 and open oceans are at least 125 with this basic understanding let's try to answer this question given here which one of the following is a correct sequence of ecosystem in order of decreasing productivity option a oceans lakes grassland mangroves option b mangroves oceans grassland lakes option c mangroves grassland lakes 
ocean option d oceans mangroves lakes and grassland and the correct answer is option c that is mangroves grassland lakes and oceans with this let's move to our next discussion our next topic is global biodiversity framework fund see it was recently ratified and launched at the 7th assembly of global environmental facility the main purpose of this finance is for the implementation of cuming montreal global biodiversity framework and also know that the council of global biodiversity framework fund is represented by the following members 16 developing countries and 14 developed countries and also it includes two members from the countries of central and eastern europe and former soviet union and also know that the decision of this council are taken up by the consensus it is important to note that world bank will serve as the trustee for this fund and it will be similar to the capacity building initiative for the transparency trust fund special climate change fund moving forward note that the funds allocation will be 20 percentage would support indigenous led initiative to protect and conserve biodiversity in this backdrop let's also understand one more concepts about cuming montreal global biodiversity framework see it is adopted in 2022 at cop15 held in montreal to the un convention on biodiversity it replaced archi targets on biodiversity that expired in 2020 it is not legally binding one it is important to know that it sets out four goals for 2050 and 23 targets for 2030 and those four goals includes the first one is to halt the human induced species extinction the second one is equitable sharing of benefits the third one is sustainable use of biodiversity and the fourth one is closing the biodiversity finance gap of 700 billion per year and one of the most important key target is that 30 percentage of the land inland water marine coastal ecosystem will be protected by 2030 it is also known as 30 by 30 deal with this basic understanding let us try to answer the question given here consider the following statements global biodiversity framework fund aims to directly support global efforts to halt and reverse the biodiversity loss by 2030 the global environmental facility is the financial mechanism that supports projects and initiatives aimed at addressing the global environmental issue select the correct answer using the following quotes 1 only 2 only both 1 and 2 neither 1 nor 2 the correct answer is option c both 1 and 2 see global biodiversity framework fund aims to directly support global efforts to halt and reverse the biodiversity loss by 2030 and it is a financial mechanism that supports projects and initiatives aimed at addressing global environmental issue that's all for this discussion with this let's move to the next topic our next topic is bara singha the bara singha sometimes bara singhe is also known as swamp deer is a deer species distributed in the indian subcontinent populations in northern and central india are fragmented and the two isolated populations occur in southwest and nepal it has been extirpated in pakistan and bangladesh and its presence is uncertain in bhutan also know that the bara singha is a state animal of indian states of madhya pradesh and uttar pradesh let's now see about its conservation status it is included in iucn red list as vulnerable it is present in appendix 1 of sites and schedule 1 of wildlife protection act 1972 Here it is important to know that historically swamp deer were found in various region including the parts of northern and central india southwest and nepal pakistan and bangladesh bara singha prefers flat and undulating grassland flat plains marshes and the areas on the outskirts of forest at times they are also found in open forested areas let's now see about its distribution in india they are found in six localities in uttar pradesh in kanha national park in madhya pradesh near damtari in chatisgarh in kaziranga and manas national park in assam also know that the swamp deer are the largest deer species in india they are excellent swimmers and can easily cross rivers and swamps that's all about this topic with this let's move to our next discussion Let's now see about crocodile species in India. India harbors three diverse crocodile species: mugger, saltwater, and gharial crocodile. Let's now see about them individually in brief. Firstly, about gharial. It is majorly present along Chambal Sanctuary, distributed along Uttar Pradesh, Rajasthan, and Madhya Pradesh. And small breeding population is also found along Sun River, Gandak, Hooghly, Gagra, and Sand Coast of Odisha. It is also found along Brahmaputra of Bhutan. Ban Bangladesh and Airavathi river its special features include long and thin snout see it is majorly found along the fresh waters and its iucn status is critically endangered let's now see about mugger or indian crocodile it is found throughout india 
and it is extinct in Bhutan and Myanmar. Its special features are U-shaped snout. It is also found along the fresh waters and its IUCN status is vulnerable. Let's now see about the saltwater crocodile. It is found along east coast that is along Odisha's Bitarkanika Wildlife Sanctuary, Andaman and Nicobar Islands and Sundarbans. It is also found along Southeast Asia. It has a V-shaped snout as its special feature. It is also found along saltish, brackish and wetlands. And its IUCN status is least concern. With this, let's move to our next topic. Our next topic is rhinos. Rhinos have long been hunted for their horns, which are highly valued in some culture. There are five surviving rhino species. They are black and white African rhino, Asian rhino species like greater one horn rhino, Sumatra and Java rhinos are still threatened by habitat loss and hunting. Let's now see about their IUCN status. The greater one horn rhino are vulnerable. Sumatra rhino are critically endangered. Java rhino are vulnerable. Black African rhino are critically endangered. White African rhino are near threatened. Going forward, let us see about the greater one horn rhino in brief. It is also known as Indian rhino. It is the largest of the rhino species. India is the home to the largest number of greater one horned rhinoceros in the world. At present, there are about 2,600 Indian rhino in India, with more than 90% of their population concentrated in Assam's Kaziranga National Park. And also know that this species is restricted to small habitats in the Indo-Nepal Terai and the northern West Bengal and Assam. In India, rhinos are mainly found in Kaziranga National Park, Pobitora Wildlife Sanctuary, Orang National Park, Manas National Park in Assam. Jaldapara National Park and Gorumara National Park in West Bengal, Dudua Tiger Reserve in Uttar Pradesh. And also note that it is included in the Schedule 1 of Wildlife Protection Act 1972. With this, let's move to our next topic. Our next topic is Asiatic Lion. See, it is also known as Persian Lion or Indian Lion. It is a member of Panthera Leo, a subspecies that is restricted to India. Its previous habitats include West Asia and Middle East before it became extinct in these regions. And also know that Asiatic lions are slightly smaller than the African lions. The Asiatic lions were once distributed to the state of West Bengal in the east and Reva in Madhya Pradesh in central India. At present, Gir National Park and Wildlife Sanctuary is the only abode of the Asiatic lions. Moving forward, let us see about its protection status. It is notified as endangered in IUCN Red List and it is also present in Appendix 1 of CITES. And with respect to Wildlife Protection Act of 1972, it is placed in Schedule 1. Let's now see about Gir National Park in brief. See, Gir National Park and Wildlife Sanctuary is located in Junagadh district of Gujarat. It was declared as a sanctuary in 1965 and a national park in 1975. The Gir Forest is the largest compact tract of dry deciduous forest in semi-arid western part of India. Gir is often linked with Maldaris, a traditional pastoral people who often survived through the ages by having a symbiotic relationship with the lion. That's all about this topic. With this basic understanding, let's try to solve this question. Which of the following statements regarding Asiatic lion and swamp deer are correct? Asiatic lion are primarily found in Gir National Park of Gujarat in India. Swamp deer, also known as Bara Singha, are predominantly found in Sundarban Mangrove Forest of West Bengal. Swamp deer primarily inhabit the wetlands and grassland of Kaziranga National Park in Assam. Which of the statements given above are not correct? 1 and 2 only, 2 and 3 only, 1 and 3 only, 1, 2 and 3. And the correct answer is option B. 213 only. See the statement 213 are incorrect because the populations are concentrated in northern and central India and are fragmented in the two isolated populations across southwestern Nepal. Swam deer also found in Kanha National Park in Madhya Pradesh and also been observed across the borders of Chhattisgarh and they are likely to be regionally extinct in West Bengal. With this, let's move to our next discussion. That's all for today's discussion. If you like this video, please hit like, share and subscribe.